that, Shiren. Wow, that was a kind of a long introduction. Um, but um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've been now with the CSP for, I think, just over a month, and I've heard amazing lectures, and I've um, also participated in the workshop together with a few of you, with Toby, so it's very, very excited, exciting that I can finally also share a bit of my wisdom, which I hope you guys find um, interesting. Let me just get this all moving. One second. Okay. So, um, as Shirel gave you in the introduction, I work currently at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. I'm now in Denver on a sabbatical, but at the museum, I work in the modern art department. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, department. We have many different loans. The history of the museum is also interesting since it is one of the first it is the first museum, art museum in Israel. It was established in 1932 uh, by Dizengoff, by the first mayor of Tel Aviv. So it's been around for a long time. And part of my work is also to research its collections. And that's how I came across this amazing story with Peggy Guggenheim. Um, you probably know Peggy, you've heard about her. There's been books, there's recently been movies. I won't be surprised if soon there'll be a, a TV program uh, on her, but she's a very colorful personality with many uh, adventures and romance um, with a very um, splashy sunglasses, personality outgoing, didn't mind to say what she had on her mind. And of course, her leading role in the modern art and the establishment of the of the second half in the, of the different art movements in the, in the second half of the 20th century. So all of this was in the back of my mind. And then I'm thinking, okay, but how is this to do with the Tel Aviv Museum of Art? Um, so what am I gonna do in this lecture? I'm gonna spend the first, let's say, seven to 10 minutes talking a bit about our collection, talking a bit about the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. So you get to understand the importance of Peggy's contribution to the museum, okay? Um, if you can just maybe drop in the chat, how many of you have been into the Tel Aviv Museum? That would be interesting to see. What I'm showing you now in this slide, it's, it's um, we have a new building since 2011 um, with this fascinating facade. Um, we're neighboring the library, the, um, the opera house, the court. So there's, it's like a center, it's a civic center of Tel Aviv where the currently where this beautiful building is um, positioned. But if you walk into the main, the old entrance to the museum, and this is what I have in this uh, picture here, um, which was built um, and inaugurated in, two, in 1971 uh, by Golda Meir, um, you'll walk through the main entrance and you'll see that you walk through the foyer and you see that you have this beautiful uh, mural by Roy Lichtenstein, um, which he made especially for the museum in 1989. And you can see the mural is divided into two pieces of art. On the right hand, you can probably recognize quite a few elements or pieces of art from uh, modern art, if it's uh, the centerpiece by Picasso, or if on the top there's a man with a fiddle, and of course Marc Chagall and the word art, and Roy Lichtenstein's, you know, very defined um, um, way of uh, making his art, like the comic style using stencils. On the right hand side, you'll see that it's also um, the same, uh, using the same colors in the same positions as in the left hand, but it's much more abstract. Um, and it also reflects the architecture of the museum itself, but I can't go in further. This is, we'll have to do a separate um, um, lecture about highlights from the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, but we're here to talk about Peggy. So we're walking through the museum, we're gonna walk up the ramps and you're gonna enter um, the, mod, the, the post impressionist and the impressionist art galleries. And, it's important to say that the museum itself, today we focus mostly on contemporary art, Israeli contemporary art, 
and international contemporary art. There is a very big collection of modern art, but since modern art today is very uh, expensive, we have we don't have any um, we don't buy modern art. I mean, we have very small um, um, exhibitions of modern art since it's not an easy thing to organize at this current time. Um, so most of our exhibitions of the modern art rely on the collection. And we're going to walk through the collection. We're going to walk through the different galleries. You'll see here, this is a gallery uh, dedicated to Simon and Marie Yaglom. And you can probably recognize a sculpture here by Degas on the background. There's uh, paintings by Utrillo. Further ahead, there's a wall dedicated to Marc Chagall. One of the paintings that we have here is a beautiful haystack by Monet, a beautiful nude from the back uh, by Renoir. These are all top class um, artworks that are wanted on different exhibitions around the world, and we often travel with them. And of course, Chagall, who was one of uh, the museum's first benefactors and donated the first work to the museum. There's a beautiful Chagall here in 1933, just before the whole eruption of Europe. And you can see that he really is sensing what's going to happen. And we're going to continue our walk through to the more to the um, further modern art uh, galleries. And you'll see there's a huge um, collection by Archipenko, a Leger, a beautiful Klimt. So we have these amazing treasures in the museum. Um, and then we would get to this gallery and it's really uh, a special works because there's a very huge, whatever's in front of us, that's a, a painting by Max Ernst, who was Peggy Guggenheim's uh, third husband. And on the wall here, you'll see there's two paintings. If I don't know if you can recognize, but they're by Jackson Pollock. And these are very special paintings because these are early works by Jackson Pollock. We're used to seeing these huge works that there's in the MoMA or in other places by Jackson, his drip paintings, yes, in Jackson Pollock's. But these works that we have here are relatively early works by Jackson Pollock. As you see here, um, the date is 1946. And you can see that his works here are still a bit figurative. Yes, can you recognize um, these stick figures? that are, um, one of them is here, a small one here, one of them is upside down. There's a lot of movement happening. There's already, um, it's pretty becoming very abstract, but it's still, even the name, the title of this work is called The Dancers. Yes, he was influenced by um, early works of Native Americans. Um, the next um, work that we have by Jackson Pollock is, a, is a, uh, a work called Earthworms. And we can see even further his uh, breaststrokes, how he uses all of the surface of the canvas. There's no center, there's no composition. Um, and it's a very, very special work because we really feel the paint. We can really feel what's happening. Um, it's still not yet one of his drip paintings, but we can see that he's moving towards it. And if we go closer and we look at the labels that are next to these works, we can see these works were gifted by Peggy Guggenheim, Venice, Italy, 1954. Now this is very special. Most of the works that I showed you beforehand, if it was the Degas, if it was the Renoir or the Chagall, were already at the museum by 1954. And these are classic works. These are works that already were rep reproduced reproducted, um, people can see them in magazines, people could recognize already the artist. But when the museum received these gifts of Jackson Pollock, who just created, oh. Sophia, your internet, I think just stopped. So hi everyone, I think Sophia noticed that. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm in full suspense. We'll give her a moment to uh, reconnect to the internet. I'll just set, try and see what's going on. One moment, one moment. Hey. Okay. One moment. 
Okay. I wish I could take it on from there, but I cannot. We're going to give her a moment to reconnect. Um, and I saw in the meantime in the chat that many of you uh, have been to the museum. Um, very big difference if you were there pre-2011 uh, or after, um, since there is the new building. Jake, I see you raised your hand. Do you want to say something? And Debbie, I mean, if you'd like to speak, you can unmute and say a few words. We're still, we're here in the background fixing uh, this issue. One moment. Let me see. Um, Okay, I can see Sophia. I just need to find her to open her mic and we're almost there. Here she is. Okay, thank you everyone for your patience. And we're back, I think. Sophia? Oh, finally. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just my computer suddenly just went blank. Okay. I don't, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I apologize. And we're back to Peggy. Okay, sorry. So I'm sorry. Okay, so we're back to Peggy. So this is a special gift. And when I saw this a few years ago, I wanted to research this further. So I went uh, to the records of Peggy Guggenheim and I, and I looked through the places where she donated work. And Peggy, um, with all of her collection, with all of her immense personality and connections, she donated numbers of work, usually singular works, to many different institutes. You can see there's a list here, Modern Art Museum, Yale, a few universities and colleges. But the only place that she donated works, uh, apart from the United States, is Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv, is the place where she could, uh, uh, donated the most works. We have oh, 36 works by, that Peggy donated. Other places she donated one or two works. So this is even more unique and even more special um, that Peggy shared this with the Tel Aviv Museum. And I wanted to ask the question, why? How come Peggy decided to donate so many works to the museum um, and, and how did this work out and how did this happen? So for this, we're going to um, research a little bit, and I'd like to share with you a bit of Peggy's biography um, and how she came to that position in 1958 to own so many works, and she was willing to part for them to the museum. So Peggy was born in 1898 in New York City. She was the middle child of two other girls, you see um, here, uh, to a very bourgeois family, uh, Jewish family, her grandfather, came to the United States from Switzerland. Um, he started off in Philadelphia, trying to sell um, lace and different materials. But the, and the, he married, and then the, he had seven children. And you can see that Salomon Guggenheim, um, the man who established the Guggenheim Museum in New York. So he's number uh, six of the Guggenheim uh, uh, family. Um, but Peggy's father, Benjamin Guggenheim um, was number five, and he was really the one together with two other brothers of his who uh, uh, brought um, the Guggenheim family to its wealth that it's well known today, because um, they started off a mining, uh, a mining company here in Colorado, in fact, which is pretty amazing because this is just a bit of a side note. I went up to Leadville here in Colorado. I don't know how many of you have been there, but they have a beautiful new synagogue there that's been renovated. And in it, there's a whole history of the Leadville community. And they have photographs of Benjamin Guggenheim there because they were part of the community there because it was a mining city. But that's also another lecture for us for next time. Well, Benjamin Guggenheim, um, was a prominent businessman. And you can see that his date that he uh, passed away is 1912. What happened on 1912? 
if any of you can think of what was one of the world leading events is the sinking of the Titanic. So Benjamin Guggenheim was on the Titanic with um, a, a lover, one of his lovers, not his wife and other, and his butler and other people. And he drowned there with the Titanic. So think of this, Peggy Guggenheim, a young girl to a very prominent Jewish family. Not many people know that the Guggenheims are a Jewish family. And we're gonna explore that a bit further in a second. Um, she, her father died. She was connected her, to her father. This picture was taken at the age of 14, at the same year where she lost her father. We can see already she is well-dressed. She is not afraid to stand in front of the camera. And you see that little dog? Well, we'll see them throughout her life. She always had one or two or four dogs always next to her. Later on, at the age of 18, we can see already that she is beginning to develop this very independent young lady um, uh, in the latest fashion, um, posing in front of the camera. And she really grew apart from her family. By the age of 21, when she could receive the money that she inherited from her father, which is $2.5 million. At the, at the time, a lot of money still is today. I think it's more or less the equivalent of $36 million today. She was ready to part from her family. She was ready to spread her wings and do something else. And that's when she, she started to work in a bookshop. She started to hang out with these young intellectuals a lot of artists in New York scene. And then she moved to Paris. She married um, uh, an artist, a Dada artist called um, Louis Weil, and she had two children. Uh, she had uh, Sinbad and Pegin, um, and she was living in Paris and in London uh, simultaneously, raising her children interested in what was happening in the uh, artist's life and intellectual life. Her, her husband was an artist, so she was involved, but she was not yet taking part, actively taking part. After eight years, she left her husband. She met somebody else, John Holmes, um, a young uh, poet, British poet, who died tragically on a, on a, um, from, from a disease. Um, and then she was, um, by the age of nearly 40, um, a left alone, an independent woman, two young kids in London, 1939. On the edge of the World War II, she decided that she wants to dive into this art world. She wants to be a figure. She wants to collect. And she uh, brings together two very important people who will help her build up this list because she doesn't know much about art. She has a few connections. She has a few... Um, people that she, she's friendly with, but she has never really established herself as a figure. So she calls upon, uh, she calls upon Sir Herbert uh, Reed, who is an, um, an art critic. He writes several books about art and education and a very prominent figure um, in the London art world. Um, so she befriends him. She asks him if she can, he can help her um, make up a list that she should be of artists that are relevant today, contemporary artists at the time, 1980, 1938, who's in the field, surrealist artists, Dada artists, yes? So they make up a list together with Marcel Duchamp, which we all know, a leading figure. And she writes, she says, I knew absolutely nothing about modern art in 1938. I was fortunate enough to have Marcel Duchamp and others to gradually learn through and to manage myself. And in the meantime, I had become an art addict. That's what she says about herself. And by the way, the movie, a documentary about her is called Art Addict. So she puts together this list and she opens up a gallery in London. It's, um, and this gallery is exhibiting all these young artists at the time. Max Ernst, you can see in the background there's a Max Ernst. Hanging, of course, is a mobile of Calder. Okay, she was Miro. All these surrealist artists, they were, that already have been around since the 1920s, but have not really had the upfront gallery space. So she opens this gallery in London, 1933, 
Um, she attracts a lot of young people, journalists and everything, but it is a failure um, economically. She doesn't manage to sell even not one pa uh, painting, okay? And she is committed to buy paintings from these artists because she represents them. So she is starting to gain this collection, but she's still not um, leading through. She's not making to make, she can't make a breakthrough. Um, and she's willing even to risk this more. Oh, this is from her, one of her exhibitions in London. You can see she's exhibiting high class, Brancusi, Henri Lorenz, Jeanne Arp, Calder, all these artists are amazing artists today, are worth millions. But at the time, she was the first one to exhibit them and give them a, a, a place in a gallery in London, okay? After this doesn't work out, she closes her gallery after a year and a half. And what does she do? Instead to move, to pack her baggage and get out of Europe, no, she goes into Paris, okay? She goes into Paris. And she starts doing this amazing rescue work. She buys a painting a day. And this is a famous thing that Peggy Guggenheim, just before the Germans invade Paris, just when people are trying to leave the city, where artists are scrambling to just hide their works, she's willing to buy uh, works of art. Now, I've got this. Um, documentary about this part. Is it working? September 1939. War has broken out of Europe and Nazis are threatening to invade France. They have also declared war on modern art. They display a selection of confiscated works at the Degenerate Art Exhibition to demonstrate the supposed moral decay of modernism. Some paintings are destroyed. Some are sold off cheap to foreign dealers. Peggy Guggenheim won't deal with the Nazis. She's in Paris, buying art directly from the artists. Us were coming to because they knew what would happen if their art went into Nazi hands. This was the same thing for their art. She's a Jew, but she's saying, very brave. Art. By spring 1940, as the Nazis invade France, Peggy is buying a painting of old, many from artists who will become household names. Her mission was to collect these pictures, and that's what she was doing, single-minded. Peggy buys over 50 works, some for just a few hundred dollars. Today, that collection is priceless. Nearly 30 years later, she will recall saving these artworks from the Nazis. I had to get them out of Paris for the German thing. And I sent them to a chateau of a friend. The German came and went. They didn't even know they put them there in a barn. Peggy has gotten her works out of Paris. But just two days before the Germans enter the city, she is still there. In the nick of time, she escapes to the south of France. There she starts yet another affair, this time with artist Max Ernst. By 1941, the French authorities are rounding up Jews in France. Peggy is in danger, and so is her collection. I wouldn't do them, so I got the picture there. I was very lucky, man. Rain was over me and sent the whole thing to New York. And I told of this. Okay, so uh, one second. So, um, Shirel will share the link with you. If you want to uh, see the movie further, you'll have an opportunity. Um, but you see, Peggy had this um, really last moment, um, I don't know, struck of luck, or if it's geniuses, or if it's willing to take the risk. She was at Paris at the right time, and she had the funds, she had the money to buy all this very um, prominent art that was just happening now. And she wasn't willing to live, leave Europe until her art was out of the country. And only afterwards she followed. So she really had her priorities up 
up high with her art. And when she arrived in New York, she didn't waste much, much time and she opened a new gallery um, in New York City at the time when there weren't many galleries around and most of them were exhibiting American artists. She opened her gallery, it was called Art of This Century. Um, and she, it was a, a quite a big gallery, a four room gallery. And you can see that it's designed in a very special way, in a very uh, surrealistic way. The walls were rounded. The paintings were hanging from the walls, sticking out. The um, furniture was designed by Jeanne Arc, by, especially by artists for this gallery. And even in one of her exhibitions, I read the lights flicked on and off every three, every few seconds. So you were really disoriented. And um, so she, what, in this gallery, she exhibited uh, works that she brought over from Europe. And this was an eye opening, an eye opener for many of the young American artists. They suddenly were seeing abstract um, art. They were seeing surrealism movement. They were seeing Dada. They were seeing things that they were, didn't know about. And um, it had an immense impact on these young artists. Not only was she exhibiting these art, these arts, she also created this um, salon where she brought together Max Ernst was at the time, Marcel Duchamp, all of these European artists were fleeing from the Nazis. So they were in New York at the time. And Peggy was really the connector between the European artists and the young American artists. And this is a quote from Jackson Pollock himself. Jackson Pollock was discovered by Peggy. Peggy met him in the Salomon, in the Guggenheim Museum. He was a carpenter there. Um, and she met him and she rescued him from his daytime job and she gave him money and said, you go and paint. But not only did she give him that opportunity to paint, she also opened his eyes. And he said, I accept the fact that the important painting of the last hundred years was done in France. American painters have generally missed the point of modern painting from the beginning to end. Thus, the fact that good European moderns are now here is very important for they bring them with them an understanding of the problems of modern painting. Think of this, think of how, what an influence did Jackson Pollock, Martha Rothko, uh, Clifford Still, all these American artists of today are household names for us. They've really transformed um, modern art. Um, they needed this exposure. They needed um, Peggy Guggenheim to come and deliver these new works in order for them to reopen their eyes and create something new, something different. After the war ended, Peggy continued her search and she left Europe, she left America. She always was very fond of Venice. And she decided that she's gonna set up um, a, a museum or gallery in Venice. Um, and she bought a, a palace and she made it into a museum. Um, and in 1949, for the first Venice Biennale after the war, she also took over the Greece, the Greek pavilion, which at the time Greek was in the middle of a, a civil war. So they, she had an empty pavilion for herself. And she, she brought over all these works that she had from America. So this was the first time that Europeans were now exposed to Jackson Pollock. This was the first time that Europeans were exposed to these American artists. So she did the same thing that she did in America where she brought the European artists to America. Now she's doing the same thing to Europe. She's bringing the American artists into Europe together with, of course, the rest of her collection. If it's uh, uh, Max Ernst, if it's Picavia, it's other artists that we'll see in a second. Um, this was a sensation. Okay, for the Venice Biennale at the time when the exhibitions were really trying to collect pieces of art just after the, the war, which really destroyed Europe um, and Italy was really in a, in a very bad state, uh, Peggy came up with this fabulous exhibition and it really set her name beforehand. You know, the world was at her feet at the time. She was really the one who is showing the world what is happening now in contemporary art. 
now we're getting finally, okay, how's all this connected to the Tuffling Museum of Art? It's an amazing story, but you know, what's the connection? So finally, I'm going to try and tie the, 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 the things together. 1952, um, Israel uh, finally had its own pavilion in the Venice Biennale. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the Venice Biennale. Um, it's on now. You should definitely go, whoever is planning a trip to Europe. Maybe Shir El is going to give you a virtual tour of it later on this summer. But it's a range that um, part of the uh, Venice Biennale is different pavilions, okay? Each country has their own pavilion. And it's a big thing. Um, Israel, which is a very young state, you know, only established a few years before, 1948, 1952 already has its first exhibition in the Venice Biennale with young Israeli artists, Ruven Rubin, uh, Mukadi, uh, who else was there, Marcel Yanko, who was a Dadaist. Um, and Peggy was invited to come and visit, visit this pin, um, pavilion. And she was very impressed by these young artists that she saw. Um, the person who curated this pavilion was uh, a man in the center here that you see here. His name was Jürgen uh, Kolb. Jürgen Kolb. He was Hungarian. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name all right. I'm sure some of you have Hungarian uh, heritage and can say it uh, better. But um, Kolb himself was a very interesting personality. He was a Holocaust survivor. He survived Bergen Belsen. And he came to Israel and he was an art critic. And at the time, he was the director of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Um, and he was a very um, a prominent figure. He loved life. He loved meeting new people. And he really um, um, found a way to connect to Peggy Guggenheim. So this encounter with Peggy led with a few more visits Kolb went over to Peggy. Peggy went over, they wrote letters between them later on in life. You can see this is uh, all from the museum's um, archives. And you can see, this is a letter that Peggy's writing to Kolb. It's quite a long letter. They're writing about her trip. She, she, he always invited her to come to Israel, but she didn't come apart from a, a time when she passed through Jerusalem. She never visited Israel, but she had this connection when, with a club where he's like um, trying to recruit, you know, trying to say, why don't you uh, lend us some of your works? Um, and Peggy at the time um, did, did not, did, and this is a letter that Kolb is writing to Peggy, but Peggy at the time um, did not really know what to do with her work. She said that she had damp, dampness in her cellar in Venice, which is pretty obvious for Venice. And she had to evacuate her cellar. So she said, okay, let's send out these uh, works. Um, but in fact, 36 works arrived in the Tel Aviv Museum and they were gifted. You know, she, she uh, Jürgen Kolb um, managed to persuade Peggy to give these works to the museum. Um, and she agreed, okay, she agreed. And they were gifted to the museum uh, which led to a fascinating exhibition at the museum in 1955. Now, it's, it's important to understand that at the time, Israel was a very, not only was it a small country, but the artists in Israel weren't really exposed, could, didn't travel much, you know, they weren't really exposed to what was happening um, at the time in Europe and, of, and even not in America, which is, was even further away. So when Jürgen Kolb organized this exhibition and people could see what is happening in, at the time, um, contemporary art, it was a real eye opener for the Israeli crowd. What you see here in this slide is the cover of the catalog of this exhibition um, that I found in our archive. Now works that participated that were part of the exhibition Oh, another thing that the exhibition itself did not take place at the museum where I showed you today, because that museum was only opened in 1971. No, the exhibition itself took place in the first museum's building, which was in fact Dizengoff's house. That's how he started the museum. 
Um, and this is where it, an old picture, it, it still exists today. It's on Sderot Rothschild in Tel Aviv, which is so interesting to know that this is a place also where a few years earlier was where the Declaration of Independence. This is Ben Gurion's famous a photograph where he's reading the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. But not many people know that this was in fact taken place. Where all this happened, not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was under siege. There was no other place. It took place in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. So that's another piece of history. But this is like this is a different exhibition of Chagall, as you see. But this is where um, Peggy Guggenheim's works. When they arrived to Israel, this is where they were hung and exhibited. Now, what are the works that were part of this exhibition? Um, Yves Tanguy, he's a French artist. Um, you can see that his work is surrealistic. He's here, he's very um, interested in marine objects. He lived by the sea and you can see there are arbit figures, but still it's very um, abstract compared to things that we know. There are also what are called bryographs um, by Man Ray. Man Ray was a surrealist artist. And what he does, he lays different objects on photographic paint uh, paper, and then he expo exposes it to light, and then he uh, develops the paper. So you have all these different textures or different remnants of objects, which he creates a composition. Um, very experimental works of art, which of course, you know, that's what the Dadaists did. That's what they did. They, they experimented in different ways how to create art. So these are also works. We received three of these works. Another very interesting piece is of a collective work. It's a collective piece by several different artists. You can see Man Ray, it's Picasso on the top, um, Victor Bruno. All of these were surrealist artists. and. What is told that they were waiting in the villa in the fa in in um, in the in sorry in Portugal to be to escape from Europe, um, and that's that's when they cre created this this work, which is a work that is made by several artists together. So, and of course Robert Ma Roberto Mata, um, he's a South American artist. Um, he was a doctor and then a surrealist painting. He was a leading figure in New York surrealist movement. Um, and also um, you can see he's using here a very strange technique that creates a different kind of texture of the work of art. You see here, um, there's like a different layers. He, he does different layers, one on top of the others, waits for them to dry off. And then he covers them and and lifts different pieces up of it. So he's trying, they're all trying different techniques, different ways of working of art. And think of it, when you see this kind of work for the first time, you're really amazed. This can really change your way of looking of what is art today. And that's what really happened to many of the people who visited this exhibition in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. There were over 50,000 people, which at the time was a huge number. I think also today, we would say that's a big number for an exhibition who came to this museum. Now, what I, um, among the things that I uh, found out during my um, research for, on this collection, is I went to the museum's library. And in the library, I found an original catalog from um, Peggy Guggenheim's exhibition in New York. Uh, from the, the opening exhibition of art of this century from 1942. And you can see it's a beautiful catalog. Their cover is by Max Ernst. And when I opened it, I was amazed to see there was a dedication from Peggy Guggenheim, okay? With the uh, best wishes to, Tel Aviv, to Museum Tel Aviv from Peggy Guggenheim. So probably Jürgen Kolb, who uh, received this catalog from Peggy, gave it to the library, but I was so, I was amazed to find just a, a, an artifact, just a piece of uh, something that connected the museum and Peggy just so close. And the catalog itself is also fascinating because it's designed in a very surrealistic way. And look here, this piece of art here, do you recognize it? We just saw it. This is Roberto Mata. 
Okay, so this work of art that we have today in the Tabu Museum was originally exhibited at the exhibition in Peggy Guggenheim in 1942 in New York, then it moved to Venice. It was exhibited in the Venice Biennale and today it's in the Tabu Museum. And I also can know all of this because if I would take this painting off the wall and turn it around, all these places where the exhibit is has stickers, yes? It has labels where each uh, museum exhibited it. So um, I opened this work, uh, this catalog, and I saw works that I have now hanging in on my walls in, in the gallery. Um, and it's beautiful to see how they designed this catalog because they did it in a, such a, a way where they didn't take a photograph of each artist, but they took only the eyes, you can see. These are the eyes of the artist. It's very surrealistic thinking, you know, to use the eyes as a window into the person's personality. And there's a small brief um, um, description of the artist and a bit more about the painting itself. But it's a beautiful uh, piece of art within itself, this uh, catalog where you can see the works that Guggenheim uh, used in the that used in her first exhibition. So all these works that I'm that here in the catalog are part of the museum's um, collection today. Now, at the at, there's still one thing that we haven't really answered: How come Peggy decided to um, donate these works? Was it because she felt after the Holocaust? After, the, after she were excel, herself had to escape Europe. And so she felt a, a, be, a better connection to the museum, to Israel. Was it because um, what she said here, she said, at the time my basement was stacked with overflow of my collection and the cellar was ve very damp. My friend Bernard Ries said that instead of lending to Dr. Kolb the pictures, I should give them to him. So I gave him 34 and then later some more. Dr. Cole was very much infatuated by me. That's of course, Peggy, she had a lot of the people who really admired her. And one day when he asked me what there was between us, I replied, nothing except 34 paintings, okay? so. You know, we can say various different things. We can say that she had this maybe amazing relationship with Paul. We can say that she has a Jewish feeling. She, we, we can say a lot of things, but she herself doesn't really admit um, this Jewish point. She, she just admits that she had a bit of dampness in the cellar and she gave away the painting. So I'm leaving that kind of an open question. There are various different articles that have been written about this subject. I will send you them in a link uh, later on uh, today, um, and then you can make your own decision. Peggy herself died in 1979 in her villa in Venice. Um, she's buried there today with her beloved dogs. Um, and her um, museum in Venice is one of the most um, popular venues um, in Europe today as a, as a museum. So her legacy really as an art collector, as a person who promoted um, art in the second half of the 21st century, really got the art exposed around the world in a very pivotal time just after the Second World War, um, is really has an influence to all the art world today, and especially to us in the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Because not only did Peggy donate these works, her generosity afterwards uh, prompted other artists um, like Max Ernst, like um, Pazner, to also give one or two works to the collection of the Tel Aviv Museum. So we were even more um, enriched by works, not only by Peggy, but by other artists who appreciate her generosity and did the same. So I really invite you all hopefully um, soon, to come to the museum. I'm not there currently, I'm in Denver, but Shirelle will be happy to meet you, show you around this amazing collection and share from firsthand um, some of these stories and to see the works themselves. Um, thank you so much. Um, if we, 
if there are a few questions now, I'm very, very happy to answer them. I'm sorry if I was a bit disorganized, but distracted by the, 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 my computer. I hope it's working now. It's and, uh, working fine. And thank you, Sophia. That was like taking us through a beautiful kind of um, investigative uh, 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 story. Um, there are a few questions here. Um, so I'm going to pick them from the chat. Um, and we'll see how much we have uh, uh, time to answer. One first question is, um, was there ever an exhibition again uh, later in time of all her collection hanging together um, as like her donation? In Tel Aviv Museum of Art? Yeah. Um, no. It's something that uh, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art now we're celebrating 90 years. Um, so um, it's one of the projects that they're going to do, the creating a movie about this story. And maybe later on, um, it is something that we'd like to do because it is it would be interesting to see all the works together once again. Yes. Um, another question is, are any are her children involved in art in any way? And do they have any connection to the Tel Aviv Museum? Okay, That's an interesting question. Um, she had two children. Her daughter, Pegin, was also an artist. Uh, but she suffered from depression and she had children herself and then she committed suicide. And um, her son um, was involved in some way in the foundation. And today the head of the foundation in Venice is her granddaughter. So there, are, there is a connection and they're still involved. Um, and the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, we have a close connection to the foundation in Venice. In fact, at the moment, there's an exhibition there about surrealist art movement and the Tel Aviv Museum uh, loan lended a work there. So we have a representation there. And we have, um, we do joint projects and of course research a lot of this uh, work uh, and um, reading the different communications and letters and everything is in both archives. So we have a close connection with them and hopefully we'll do something together in the future also. Um, I see Joe has his hand raised. Joe, can you unmute and ask your question? Joe? Okay, yes. yeah, I finally got it. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, when I was at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art several years ago, maybe 10, 12, and they did a Chagall exhibit, and I noticed that the uh, painting seemed faded in color compared to the catalog. I'm wondering whether the Chagall that you have uh, has faded in color in, the, in terms of the uh, paints that he used. Um, and also with this collection, because I'm very much interested in the reproduction of art and whether you're using pigment or other kinds of inks uh, in the more modern digital uh, format, but do uh, traditional paintings have a similar problem at, at your museum? Um, well, that's a great question. It's a bit, uh, it's a side note to our subject, but the Chagall that I showed you just now in the presentation went through a very, very um, detailed preservation project about seven or eight years ago. Um, there's actually uh, material on it on the internet. Um, and there's a whole project and it went through a whole re-cleaning and everything. And that's why it looks so uh, colorful and beautiful. So not, you know, paintings, especially oils throughout the years do have a uh, deterioration. And part of the, what we do in the museum is preservation. And a lot of work is done to clean up these paintings and make them presentable. So. So Sophia, I think we have time for at least another question, which uh, uh, I'd like to ask you, and that's um, how do you start your research? Is there a list of research things that need to be uh, looked into? Is that something that piques your interest? Like how does this uh, how does this work, and how did you start your investigation into Peggy Guggenheim's connection to the museum? Um. I just, I, like I showed you, I was walking through the galleries. I was a young curator and it got my, it's, you know, it, I saw the label and I said, wow, this is amazing. I want to know the story behind it. 
So that's how I did it. It's, I'm, I do a lot of other things. So it's usually like a side thing. When I have a bit of time, I'll continue and research. And uh, it's a lot of emails. It's a lot of places that you have to go and see personally and talk to people and everything. Um, so it's, it's not something that was towards a specific cause, like an exhibition or catalog, but it's all worthwhile because since I, I didn't unveil it because it was something that it was well known and it's been talked about for, you know, since we received it, but since I maybe put a bit more spotlight to this story, so the museum has really, um, promoted it and I gave a lot of lectures and as I said now for the 90 years of the museum they're making a movie of it and there's been articles about it in newspapers so it's received more and more publicity and I am working towards hopefully one day to put the whole collection together and give it a re-examination because that would be really interesting by the way it's 12 works on um on oil oil works and the rest are works on paper and for photographs so it's it's kind of mixed. It's not only oils that I show you. And um, a follow-up question. Are these things like you showed us the catalog with her dedication and letters, are these things open to the public? Is there a way to see them or is it like special access that you have? Uh, um, no, it's not open to the public because it is something that needs to be uh, stored in conservation uh, conditions. But if you're interested and you come to the museum, if you are in touch with a curator or whoever's there so of course you can see it it's uh, yeah. also now we have csp now has personal connections yes, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and i can see here that there's somebody asking about helena rubinstein's connection to the Tavu museum which is also fascinating it's a fascinating story and we also in the museum just now opened um, a new exhibition with helena rubinstein's miniature rooms um it's also a project that I worked on before I left to Denver. Um, and that's another lecture because again, Helena Rubinstein, you know, you think what is her connection to the museum, Tavu Museum of Art and what is she to do with, with Israel? Um, but she had a deep connection and she was very much involved in the museum um, together with other people. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of history in the museum that I'd love to share with you further on. Thanks. So um, I have here questions. Is there ways, are there ways to get in touch via email with Sophia? Yes, you can email me and I'll create the connections. And after this uh, session, we'll be sending you all the links to go further. Uh, Sophia, I want to thank you for taking us through this journey. It's also mm -hmm. wonderful, I think, and inspiring to see how pure curiosity um, can take us in these amazing journeys. Um, and I think we all look forward to see, to sharing more of your knowledge and uh, research into new things. Maybe one last question since someone asked, what are you doing in Denver? And since you're also a CC uh, kind of guest host, uh, who will, will include that question? Um, I'm actually taking a, a little bit of a break. Um, museum work is very, very intense. And we had an opportunity to come out to be in Denver. My husband is working here and I have an opportunity to work remotely on a few different projects, also for the museum and also for other private things. And I give lectures online and other things. So it's just an opportunity to enjoy Colorado. And I invite you all to come here because it's really beautiful. Um, an opportunity for my family to see other Jewish communities um, and um, to take a little bit of a break from, uh, from the museum and from the work in the art world and to see a bit of nature and that kind of thing. Um, I'll be happy to connect to whoever has questions, whoever wants to share um, interests. Shirel can share my email. And I hope to see you on further programs. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, and um, yeah. Have a great day. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're looking forward to seeing you in our future programs. And I'm reminding you that June to August is our fundraising uh, drive and to help us have all these 
amazing programs, you're more than welcome to donate and take part in the CSP community. I dropped the link in the chat just now again. And have a beautiful weekend. Shabbat Shalom and happy Shavuot. We'll be meeting you uh, after the holiday. Have a wonderful day, evening, and good night from Tel Aviv. I'm seeing Deborah, I'm seeing Barbara, I'm seeing Ahuva. This is kind of fun. I'm getting to know all of you and like, it's just beautiful to see your faces. Hi, Deb. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful day.